we are um, heading towards the middle of the book of Mark. And, um, and I want you to just have a look at something quickly. Just turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. This is the midway part of Mark and verse 29 and 30. All of Mark is leading in the beginning to this point. This is a point of acknowledgement of who Christ Jesus is. And it's kind of an eye-opening uh, statement that happens that, that, that kind of lumps everything that Christ has done, Paul puts in one statement. It's a realization of who Jesus Christ is. From verse 27 it says, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? This is an incredible, uh, a, a penetrating question. Who do you say I am? Who do you, as, a, as somebody who's following me, as somebody who's seeing everything before you, who do you say I am? And Peter says those incredible words, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Everything that Jesus has been doing has been leading to this point of somebody saying, you are the Christ, you are Jesus, you are the anointed one, you're the one that can come down and save our souls, that's who you are. Now think about all the times where Jesus has done something and he said, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. When you go, do not say a word. But from that point onwards, he's very open. And he wants people to know because his time is starting to tick away slowly. So you can turn back to chapter 6. It's an incredibly important question. As you sit there and, 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 and you've read countless amounts of Scripture, you've gone through it and you've understood it and, 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 and you've applied it to your lives, that question will haunt us for the rest of our days. If we cannot have a definitive answer to that question, who do you say I am, then we've missed the boat totally of who Jesus is. We haven't come to a, a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done for humanity. That, that single act of, 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 of dying on a cross, but then that raising from the dead is for each one of us and has been applied to our lives in the form of faith. Christ's faith has been imparted to each one of us. But constantly you'll ask the question, Bruce... Keith, Rob, who do you say I am? And we've got to give that definitive answer. People are, are slowly starting to get insights into who Jesus truly is. But they don't quite get it. They don't quite, quite see the bigger picture. Yes, there's incredible need that was in the region at that time. But they don't get it. I'm sure they would have been incredibly schooled in the Old Testament. And they, they would have known that a Messiah was going to come. Somebody that would take away all the pain and the suffering of people. But for their, their minds, it was, it was circumstantial. God is going to help me in the circumstance that I am because I want it. Not because of salvation. They were thinking that. So here in this chapter, we have a revelation of Jesus being rejected. Jesus sending out the disciples, the account of John the Baptist's death at the hands of Herod, feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and then healing the sick. An incredible picture of, of, of just this, this, this plethora of things that Jesus did to show who he is. Thank you so much, Kerry, for reading. I know it was a marathon, an absolute marathon. But I'm glad that we can actually get through big chunks of Scripture like that. That we can hear it being read above the wonderful rain that's falling. But that we can come to an understanding of, of what Scripture says in its entirety. Not just take a little, little bit of Scripture and hang on to that. But let's, let's have a, a biblical view of Scripture from the Old Testament right into the New Testament. So let's get stuck in. Well, we've got the rejection of Jesus. The enormous cost of rejecting Jesus is damnation and hell. 
We read and, and, and we hear these people, the comments that come out. Isn't this Mary's son? Now in those days, you were called according to your father. So your father, if your father was a, a mason, you were uh, called something after the mason, the son of the mason. But yes, Mary's son, the carpenter. Derogatory, very, very uh, uh, low view of women. Isn't that just Jesus? We know his family. Who does he think he is? Coming around you and throwing his weight around. Very derogatory towards Jesus. They asked incredibly disparaging questions about his origin and his teachings. Where does he get this teaching from? Where does it, it can't come from him. We know him. He lived just down the road. Isn't that so true? When you go to your own family and you want to give the gospel to them and you speak to them and you talk about the, the transformation that God has caused in your life. Aren't you just Bruce? <laughs> we, saw, we watched you grow up. You were a naughty so-and-so. So, um, you know, why are you telling us? Secondly, they question the wisdom that was given to him. Where did he get this wisdom from? Who gave it to him? We want to speak to those people that gave it to him. And then thirdly, his power to do miracles. So all of this come together. Two answers exist. Either the power came from God or it came from Satan. Two places. It couldn't have come from anywhere else. They took offense at him. Who are you to come and lecture us? Have you heard that before? Has one of your family members said that to you? Who are you? Look at your own life. Look at your kids. Look at your work. Look at, look at how you, you dress. And you want to come and speak to me? Jesus responded with a well-known proverb. A prophet is not appreciated at home. The people were characterized by hard hearts. The people of Nazareth re represent the blindness of Israel. And God was constantly knocking on the door of the hearts of the people of Israel. Would they answer? Most of them not. Most of them would not let God in. They knew God as, as, as this distant, far-off being that was over everybody. But they didn't know Him as somebody intimate, as somebody who would have a relationship with them. And here was Christ in bodily form coming to walk the streets to introduce them, not only to Himself, but to the Father. And they closed off their hearts. Hard-hearted. This is a small picture of what the disciples would face, but also of what you will face today. As you go about your business, of speaking to people about Jesus, of people speaking to you and saying, oh, you're religious, you go to church, don't you? Um, what's this Jesus nonsense in any case? You've got to deal with hard-heartedness all the time. And Jesus knew this. So now he's about to send the twelve out. So he sends the twelve out to do the work he has been training them to do. And he gives them authority over unclean spirits. And he says to them, go. Go and evangelize. Go and tell people about me. Go and tell them about the good news of the gospel. The gospel that changes lives, that totally transforms people from, from what they were before to something incredibly beautiful by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus set some rules for, for evangelism. He says, anyone does not receive you, won't listen to you, leave them with God. Have you had those people where you've, you've been speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking? And you kind of, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do anymore. You need to take those people and say, God, they're yours. I can't do anything. I've done everything that I possibly can. They're yours now. Would you sort them out? That's number one. Number two, if people receive you, form a relationship. Speak to them about the good news constantly, often. I've got a, a, a friend that I'm working with at the moment, and we're going to start going through the book of Mark and um, talking about Jesus. And I want to I show him he's got no church background, has, has no idea about the gospel. I've spoken to him about the gospel a couple of times. But I really want to sit down and every, t every opportunity I get to speak to him and just say, this is my passion. We both, we both love football. He's a very good um, uh, soccer manager and coach. Um, 
And, and, and so there's that commonality that we have. But I want to use that commonality to be able to speak into his life and tell him who Jesus is. That he, he, he thinks he's got his life made, but it's not. He doesn't have Jesus. So as Jesus sends him out, it, it brings to mind Matthew 28, where he says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, has been given to Jesus. So therefore, go. Go and make disciples. I can just see him speaking to the, the disciples. Go. Make people like you are. That I've been pouring into your life. Now pour into others, other lives. Teach them about me. Baptize them when they pre- make a profession of faith. Baptize them in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all of my commands and know that I will be with you. Do you feel kind of alone sometimes where you are speaking to somebody and you feel like, man, you know, I I just feel like going to a small crack in the floor because I feel so alone. This is such a hard thing to be able to witness to somebody about Jesus Christ. Know that Jesus is with you. He is with you. He has promised, and He will be with you. Just on, on evangelism, um, we have some, some tracks at the back there that we made up. So please, if you, if you can, grab. But I also went to Kurong, and um, uh, uh, Josh McDowell, more than a carpenter, and also uh, 10 Reasons Jesus Came to Die, John Piper. They, I put some at the back there. What I do is if I go to a coffee shop, um, I will leave one on the table, or I'll give somebody one. Um, and it's just, it's just a question. Have you got one of these? You know, don't say, do you want? People say, no. Say, have you got one of these? Oh, what are these? And, 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 and they take it from you. you. Say, have a read. And um, when you see them again, you say, did you have a read of that material? You know, just, just, just keep asking the question. And just, just be constant in your evangelizing of people. Just, God has given you a personality. Use that personality to speak into people's lives. Um, So please, they are at the back there if you would like to grab a couple and take it with you. See, here's Jesus sending the 12 out. And so the same way he sends you and I out. We don't have to go and uh, uh, preach on street corners. He's not calling us. Some, Some of you might. And there are people, I've got lots of friends that do that. But more importantly, he wants you to use what God has given you. Your natural ability, just your your friendliness, just your your winsome personality that I know all of you have got, to be able to speak into people's lives. Pray with them. You know, when I, I, I've got a rule for myself. When somebody says to me, Bruce, will you pray for such and such and such? I'll say, okay, let's do it now. And they kind of like get in public, you know. I said, yes, you want to pray to God? Let's do it now. And then they, and, 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 and they're so thankful for that. Practice those, those little things as we go on. Then in verses 14 to 29, we see a type of Christ being cut down. We see John the Baptist, an account of him um, being arrested by Herod, put in jail. And Herod would be so inquisitive and come and sit with John. And John would tell him that he had done the wrong thing. He had married his, his, his brother's wife. And there was evil in the Lord's sight. And even though Herod wanted to really do away with John the Baptist, he was just captivated by this man, this this crazy man in in, in, um, camel skin and who ate locusts and wild honey. He came proclaiming the kingdom of God. Wasn't phased by popular opinion. He didn't care what people thought of him. He just wanted everybody to know that the Messiah was coming. His name is Jesus and you need to get your, your heart right. He spoke even to King Herod, and he lost his life. This would have reminded Jesus of his mortality. He would remember that that he came to die on this earth for people like us, for you and me. He came to give his life, and he knew that the end was coming at a rapid pace. This was a little insight into the suffering and death, not only of Jesus, but especially of his disciples that would follow him. It wasn't an easy life. The disciples would meet horrible, horrible deaths. Andrew was crucified. Peter and Paul were both killed in Rome. Thomas died with, uh, 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 when he was pierced through by four soldiers with their spears. Philip was put to death for converting the proconsul's wife. 
Matthew martyred for the gospel. James stoned and clubbed. Simon killed for refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. John was boiled in oil and he survived and he was exiled to Patmos. If you are under any illusion that the Christian life is easy, that it's going to be a bunch of roses, I'm sorry, I'm going to really pop that bubble right now. It's a life of suffering. It's a life of being pushed to one side. It's a life of, of, of knowing that if you know what Jesus went through, you are going to go through that as well. Maybe not the suffering and dying, but people are going to persecute you. It started already. How do you feel about that? How do you feel that you are now part of something that is totally on the outer in society and yet is the only way to get salvation? You are part of it. You are part of the, the great story of the martyrs of the faith. Your legacy will live on through your children and your children's children. That's why it was so important for me to speak to both Peter and to Chrissy to say, model your life after Christ so that they have a, 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 a physical uh, model that they can follow and so that you can pass on the word of Christ to your kids. So Jesus now hears of John. And you can imagine the sorrow in his heart. He's thinking, man, I know my end is near. But I'm going to press on. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to carry on to the end. We then see Jesus feeding the 5,000. Apostles were overjoyed at what they've just encountered. They've just come back from, from casting out demons and, and, and seeing people come to faith in Christ and baptizing people. They've just seen this all play out before their eyes. Can you imagine the, 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 the joy that they have, the excitement? Jesus, man, this was incredible. And he says to them, come away with me to a desolate place. And they go away to the desolate place and they arrive there and the people are there already. They knew exactly where they were going. And you can imagine the disciples are tired. They are finished. They haven't had anything to eat. And it's been days and days of just go, go, go. And there's no rest. Notice in verse 34, great crowd. What does Jesus do? He has compassion in his heart. He sees them and he sees that they've got no shepherd. They've got nobody to lead them. And he has compassion. He loves them. He looks in their eyes and, and he wants to save each one of them. He wants them to come to a saving knowledge of who he is. So he began to teach them. Now it's getting late and there's no food and it's a desolate place. So the, 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 the disciples come to him and say, Lord, this is a desolate place. Can you send them away? Send them away to get some food. And what does Jesus say to them? You feed them. <laughs> But Lord, it would take eight months worth of salary to feed all these people. Now just think for a moment. They've just come from casting out demons. They've just come from uh, bringing salvation to people. They've just come from baptizing. They come from this incredible high. Now Jesus challenges them. You feed them. If you can cast out demons, you can feed them. But once again, the faith just absolutely breaks down. This is an incredible teaching moment. Christ is wanting them to understand that He is the bread of life. So He says, what have you got? Oh, just some loaves and some fish. Prays over them. Starts breaking and they multiply. We don't quite know how it happens. And He does the miracle, but even the disciples don't get it. Even though they don't recognize that, man, He, he took the bread and He broke it and, and, and this miracle happened before us and, and that's it? Is that where it stops? No! Look to the person who's doing the miracle. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the one that can give us something that we'll never hunger again. He's the one that will give us something to drink that we'll never thirst again. Everything that we are is in Christ Jesus and not in the physical world that we can touch and that we can see. John 6.35, uh, uh, um, Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Wow, incredible words. But they didn't get it because their hearts were hard. In verse 45, we've got Jesus walking on the water. He sends the disciples across in a boat, and there's a massive storm, and Jesus comes walking on the water. 
I don't know about you, but if somebody comes walking on the water past me, I'm freaking out. I'm really, really freaking out. And I can see the disciples. They must have, they must have thought, what is going on? There's a ghost here. And Jesus says these incredible words, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he gets in the boat. And everything just calms down. And you've got this incredible middle, uh, miracle worker, worker who's just walked on the water in the boat with you now. <laughs> they didn't understand about the loaves. In other words, the world around them took precedence over who Jesus was. Their hearts were hardened. And they still didn't get it. Can you see how we're leading up to uh, Matthew 8, verses 28 and, 20, uh, yeah, 28 and 29? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then the last little bit. Day by day, Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. Did miracles. Showed everyone who he was. But it's just like today. People are blinded. They're blinded by circumstance around them. They're blinded by their worldly needs, hunger, illness, thirst, by greed. I want more, and I want it now. Circumstance has a way of really getting our focus. Last night at, at about quarter to ten, we... Uh, I got the text from my, my sister that my dad just passed away. Um, so he, he was 93 and his organs were just shutting down and, and so he passed away. And it's so easy for me to focus on that. It's so easy for me to, 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 to look at that and say, okay, God, where were you? Why, why, why did he suffer? Why? But all I can hear is verse 45. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Circumstance is going to cloud our judgment. Circumstance is going to blind us. The world is going to blind us. What are we going to do? Are we going to let it? Are we going to look at the world? Are we going to look at the things around us and say, well, this is what we have now, so, so I want to block Christ out? Or do we say, Jesus, everything belongs to you. You are everything. You are my everything. And I'm going to stay rooted to you the Lord and Savior of my life. We're going through a really, really tough time with Joel at the moment. He, um, he went and um, stayed at a friend's house last night and, um, and then we found out that he's gallivanting all over the place. All of, all of our time, Sharon and I have preached to him, we've spoken to him, we've prayed for him, and I covered your prayers for our family and, and for Joel too, but he, he's, really, he's really not wanting what God wants for him in his life. He, he really is wanting to do his own thing, and as hard as, as it is for us as parents, we have to let him. We, there's nothing we can do. Um, so I would cover your prayers, but even that is not going to take the, my focus off of Christ. Christ has got him in the palm of his hands and Christ has got him where he needs him. And so I've handed and we've handed Joel over to the Lord. Just as this dedication this morning, we had to do that as parents too. And I know some of you have had tough times with your kids too. But please pray for him. And we know that God is going is to keep him. Can I encourage you? Day by day, moment by moment. Know that, that Christ Jesus has got you in the palm of his hand. No matter what circumstance come your way, no matter what happens in your life, trust Christ. Forsake everything else. Push everything else to the side. Look to him. Do not look to circumstance. Know that he will make a way. He will and he does and he can and he will. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this wonderful, wonderful chapter. It's a long chapter, but it's such a meaningful chapter. Lord, help us to look to you as, as, as the way, the truth, the life, the bread of life, the living water. 
Lord, we love you. And we will continue to follow you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.